Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to our third Let's Connect engagement. Um, really happy that you could join us. Today we're trying a slightly different uh, approach. We're going to do some live meeting. We're expecting a whole lot of people in, and I didn't want to have any complications with regard to, uh, to other forms of meetings. So again, thank you for joining us. Um, really appreciate uh, your time and hopefully you'll find some value in certain of the things that we're going to talk to you about today. Uh, in order for us to get to that point, let's just share the agenda quickly. Um, so uh, obviously we're, we know that people are the driving force beyond progress, particularly now, and there's a large movement saying that people that are now working from home are a little bit more um, conducive to ideas. They're coming up with better ideas. Um, and as a result of that, uh, innovation is happening at a faster pace. I'm pretty certain I'm going to share some of why I say that uh, with you shortly. So I'll talk a little bit around that in the ambits of teams and how quickly that's moving at the moment. And then we can't go anywhere without having a decent discussion around how that moves, how these moves into hybrid workspaces, how these moves into uh, different areas of expertise, different applications are surrounded and incorporated into the security uh, environment from a Microsoft perspective. Then we'll finish off with the Q&A and we should take it from there. So guys, sit back, relax a little while. Uh, let's talk a little bit around a, a couple of, uh, of the points that have come up. So obviously front and center for us is that people are the driving force behind progress. Uh, passionate okay. people drive success. Okay. Sorry. Am I not sharing it? No. How did that unshare? Don't know. I shared it. It was sharing. There we go. Let's just go back up then quickly. I'm not going to go back to the agenda. You know what the agenda is. It's basically two points. It's a point around innovation in teams and it's a point around security and how that surrounds uh, any application from a Microsoft perspective. So literally in our um, in our environment, uh, critical at this present moment in time uh, to understand that we're trying to approach this uh, engagement for small, medium sized businesses. When I talk about small businesses, I'm talking about from five users up to 50. Uh, that's Microsoft's uh, small business uh, section. We have medium sized business from 50 users up to 250 users. And then the mid-sized uh, user count started 250 to 500. After that, you're considered enterprise. Um, and uh, obviously, we're trying to get solutions into the small and medium-sized uh, organizations that will assist them with uh, regard to driving progress, with, uh, with uh, assisting with regard to making sure that productivity is maintained. Uh, doesn't matter where you work. Um, I mean, we all know that we are hugely resilient uh, a feature on Earth. Um, doesn't matter what is thrown at us, we're able to move through that and get uh, better at what we do. Um, but we mustn't lose the impact that us being social animals, uh, literally in the whole field, uh, is important for us to also interact uh, decently with our colleagues, uh, some face to face, some through uh, teams, uh, some through other mechanisms. But obviously the, the impact that we've had literally at the end of the day is around the fact that we want flexibility as users. We want organizations to be flexible in the way in which they allow us to use uh, and engage. And we want tools that assist us to engage better and better throughout uh, our, uh, our work environment. And that's what we're going to try and portray today. So going through that, just a little bit of uh, market trends from Microsoft before I really kick off with the meat of this stuff. 84% of global uh, business decision makers, that's what BDM stand for. And sorry, I should always have a sheet up with the 300 different three letter acronyms that are used in our discussion points, particularly when it comes to Microsoft. Nevertheless, 84% of glo global uh, BDMs uh, are, are accelerating their digital transformation. Guys, I've never seen this as real as that fateful March three years ago, for two years prior to us experiencing lockdown, experiencing anything to do with COVID, it was a, it was a pretty mundane discussion I was trying to have with the whole of Vox. It was, please guys, there's a new functionality out from Microsoft. It's called Teams, it's a collaborative network. Um, it is really, really cool. Uh, 
it's going to revolutionize the world, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And I was told to go and play in the road. Go get lost. I've got exchange, and I come to the office, and I can have a face-to-face -face meeting, and I can go to customers, etc., etc., etc. How weird did that not change for me within 14 days? I had to then get super in touch with teams. I had to figure out how every single bit of technology or piece of functionality within Teams worked. And I had to take that discovery that I was making on a daily basis and go and re-portray it to everybody in the Vox organization in order for us to continue and build on the momentum that we had going into COVID. It was a challenge of note, but I could tell you that it transformed and really accelerated the way in which we utilized this small little tool at that point in time, and I'll show you how it's expanded. I think second to that, obviously, for us is that security, based on the fact that we are now utilizing the cloud environments, platform as a service, infrastructure as a service, and software as a service to the extent that we are, is really, really becoming an extremely, extremely important part of our discussions. You can't just have the security discussion without having the compliance discussion. Good and all good and well that I can close out my environment, but my users will still make mistakes. They may still send out things that they shouldn't, and therefore we wrap security and compliance together. And we'll talk about that at a later point with another colleague of mine. I think one of the things that struck me quite a bit out of the surveys and things that Microsoft had done is obviously the fact that we are all now really changing the way in which we spend our money. We are starting to look even in our businesses the same way as what we do in our private lives to create ourselves some cash reserves. We want to be ready for an eventuality, for a crisis, for a pandemic, for whatever it is at the end of the day that could potentially happen and ensure that we are ready for that. So really good to see that people are starting to build out uh, cash reserves um, and I suppose the only way to do that is either to sell more or to save more. And hopefully through today's technology discussion, you can pick out that there are places where you can cut costs by introducing better, quicker, faster tool sets to assist both you, your employees, your employer, um, and anybody out in market that wants to do business with you. So I really think that cloud-based productivity tool sets are the way to go for the future in terms of making sure that that happens. Right, so my name is Doug Morrison. I'll be presenting uh, the Teams Innovations designs from Microsoft, Microsoft Slides, and uh, talking you through some of the enhancements, some of the things that you may know already, some of the things that you don't. And for me, the goal always is if there's one thing that stands out, it will be great for us to understand uh, what that is. Feedback to us, talk to us about some of the additional subjects, hone in on some of the subject points that we're talking about, and let us know uh, what and how you feel about uh, about the engagement. Um, so hybrid workers, you have to stay. This is a general comment being made by most organizations. Uh, at an uh, operator level, so AWS, Google, Microsoft, all the guys are in the same place saying that this is something that's going to happen. And for us, it's about having a look at what do workers say, what do employers say, and at this point in time, it reflects that 73% of the workforce want an option to do remote work or wants flexibility in terms of doing remote work. Uh, which is really a good, uh, a, a really good indication of where and how um, people have started maneuvering and working around the effects of the pandemic, and obviously creating us a much better, and quicker and easier way to to work. Um, people want more in-person work or collaboration. So the in-person work is kind of a conflict with regard to that fact that people want flexibility and want to stay at home and work from home more than work from the office. But it makes sense, again, relating back to that social discussion a little bit earlier on, that people are still social, they do want to interact. And again, the tool sets are starting to become really intuitive in understanding that and portraying that as you move through the uh, Teams uh, continuum. And then 66% of uh, leaders 
are considering redesigning their workspace for hybrid work. And I think that that's a great, uh, a great example of how that bridge between management and workers starting to to kind of break. Um, in the fact that it would be silly to have people come into the office just to sit and have teams meetings. Doesn't make any sense to me. Probably doesn't make any sense to a huge amount of the workforce at this present moment in time. So literally from my perspective at the end of the day, really good to see that leaders are starting to look at this. I can share an example from a Vox perspective. We've already closed down some of our bigger uh, offices in Cape Town and Durban, and we've moved into a smaller environment where you book your desk if you want to go in. Um, and we have people that go in, people go in because they've got connectivity issues, because of load shedding, because of other external issues that they have. And it really, really at the end, it makes sense for us to have this kind of hybrid engagement, but we don't need the huge environments. And what we have started doing is started looking at that engagement where we can have hybrid meetings. Some people are in the office, some people are utilizing them, Teams technology to drive Teams meetings. Um, or rooms meetings together with the people that just sign in and log in, and I'll talk about that in a short while. So really cool that these kind of hybrid discussions are still happening despite the fact that we've had uh, we've had uh, legislation or not legislation. We've had government move the goalpost and saying that uh, there's less and less of a pandemic, which I'm happy with at the end of the day anyway. So it's obviously transformed how we work. So where we were with the standard hours, nine to five. Um, you had dedicated fo uh, focus work time, again, the nine to five discussion. Um, On-site attendees uh, were seen to have an advantage. So whoever was at work in comparison to our remote workers or our regional workers uh, seemed to be, um, seemed to have a better off. They were able, more connected, more informed. Um, uh, I can't vouch for the last one, distractionless uh, environment. Um, I found now that I'm going back to work that those that kind of hour drive, the hour drive back, um, the time that I'm there and all the chats at the coffee machine and all that kind of stuff actually puts me further back uh, in my work than what uh, than what I'm, I was I'm used to uh, currently working from home. Uh, so what's changed? Obviously, we've got a decrease in the work life balance um, because of the the fact that we're actually utilizing more of our private time now to do work and we're not actually thinking about taking focus time. And there's some great tools that I'll talk to you about in a little bit while called insights um, that literally takes the intelligence of the applications that or, or takes information, builds an intelligent roadmap for you um, and tells you how to balance your, your engagement better. Calculated with uh, with a colleague of mine the other day that currently we're working six and a half days a week. That's with art weekends. That's just in the week, the extra time early in the morning, the extra time late in the afternoon or, 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 or early evening, uh, the extra time over lunch time, the extra time over focus time. It just is a huge amount of additional work that we're or outputs that we did. We've never had more meetings than what we have now. I've never had more meetings than what I've had now. Last week, I did six demonstrations in one day. I cannot tell you how draining that is. Um, I had a half an hour break between, which I used to do uh, to do administration or to do minutes, and it was really, really a taxing day. So it's really, really common for us to have back-to-back -back meetings. Then my question is, when do we ever do our work? Um, there's been a, the, there was a total shift, obviously, at a point in time to remote work only. Uh, very cool for us in terms of the way in which it drove technology, but also bad for us in terms of decreased work-life balance, more meetings. Um, and then staying engaged is a challenge. It's still a challenge. We still feel a little bit isolated. We still feel like we need to have to go and interact with people, but that's only because the tool sets haven't caught up with the way in which we interact. And I'll show you how Microsoft's dealing with that challenge. So what do we need now? Well, we need to collaborate in our own time. We need to be able to talk and we need to talk with people. We need FaceTime. We need to be able to see each other like you're seeing me at the moment, but I can't see you and I don't know whether I'm actually getting through to you. So this is the kind of challenges that we have. We need to empower personal work styles. Some people work early in the day better than what they work later in the afternoon and vice versa. Some people like 
hectic morning schedules and a little bit more relaxed afternoon schedules. We need to be able to empower that, but also make sure that that balance doesn't conflict with the outputs that we're trying to achieve. We want to and need to have inclusive meetings. We have got to stop this, this no cameras, et cetera, et cetera. Please put on some makeup or don't put on makeup. I don't care, but just arrive with your video on. I'm very, very happy with that. And from the boy's side, comb your hair, man. It's just easy to do. Get on with it. And then I think one of the things that we're starting to see emerge now is people are starting to become more and more comfortable um, with the interaction over a live meeting or a Teams meeting or a meeting where the video conferencing is on. I mean, I do demonstrations out to the company on a regular basis, and it's good to see that people join the meeting sitting in bed, hand, holding their hand out, um, having a coffee, because it, at the end of the day, it is half past seven in the morning. Um, it is before work, so allow them that flexibility to be themselves. Um, I think that's very cool. Right, so this is all cool. This is how we do things. Microsoft also brought out a report around the 2022 uh, findings. They did a huge, huge um, engagement with both employees and employees, but mainly focused on the employees. And they came up with a couple of findings. Employees have a new worth it equation. Is it worth my while working six and a half hours, uh, six and a half days in a five day week? If it is, and I'm achieving something great, if I'm working that amount of time, I don't have focus time, I don't have the ability to still take my kids to school, bring them back, whatever that hybrid engagement is, is it worth it for me? And then you find how they flux and move around in industry. Managers feel wedged between a leadership and employee expectations. Managers want to bring everybody back to the office because they feel they have control employees, more employees are saying, you know what, I want to move away from this going into the office experience or having to go into the office and move more towards a, uh, a work from, from home experience. Lots more people are saying that now. So the other thing that, that, that stuck out quite a bit is the leaders uh, need to make the offer, come into the office worthwhile. If you think about it, over an hour period, you could lose out two meetings, at least two meetings, or alternatively, you're losing out on the ability to do two or three quotes or at least a half an hour's worth of decent administration. So that commute at the end of the day becomes an extremely important part of the discussion. And I think that that's going to drive a huge amount more interaction with uh, uh, between employer and employees um, as to how things should be shaped. I think one of the things that also sticks out to me in that space is if I'm going to come to the office, it cannot be that dreary, drecky, old, this your desk, sit down, do what you want to do there. It's got to be spruced up. It's got to look better. I've got to have the ability to feel like I'm at home when I'm there. I'm not saying put a bed and a couch down. I'm saying make it easy for me to walk into a boardroom and still have a, a decent uh, meeting like this one that we have now, a live meeting, but make it easy for me to do that. Make it easy for me to stand at my desk when I need to. Make it easy for me to sit down when I need to. Just make it easier for me to come to work. That's that's the stuff that, uh, that, uh, that makes a difference. Um, it's not necessarily pay me because I'm traveling back to the office. That's the least of the, the, the worries. It's make it worth my while to come there because that environment is as conducive to me working as what I am at home. Um, and for us, this is the point a little bit earlier on around the six and a half days, but being be, or having flexible work should not mean that you're always on. I think people need to start designing and Microsoft is looking at this themselves, starting to design a way in which certain etiquette and ethical rules should be maintained with regard to meetings. So they've already introduced that on a Friday afternoon, there are no customer meetings or no partner meetings to be held. That is the time for you to sit back and actually get through your administration, which I think is really, really awesome. Uh, we sometimes have people interviews still at 4.30 in the afternoon on a Friday. And I think that that just, it just is, it's, it's the end of the week. It's time for you to sit back and just recoup, get the stuff done that you need to get done that's critical, that's been carrying over for two or three days and move on from that. 
And then don't call me at seven o'clock in that evening to have a chat around what our forecast is going to be for Monday. I think these are the kind of ethical things and, and stuff that we need to start working on. And then rebuilding uh, our social capital looks very, very different at the moment. The way in which people are coming to the fore with ideas is changing radically. And Microsoft views this, that we've moved from the herd experience into a great experience now with regard to um, uh, with regard to uh, ensuring that we get um, more innovation uh, out of uh, people because they sit, they've got time to be creative and so forth. So labored the point a bit much. Let's just quickly go through some of the functionality that Microsoft has had uh, through this uh, designation, the Teams Innovation and Design for Hybrid Work. So helping people work together no matter where uh, or, or, or when, uh, work happens extremely important for these people at the end of the day. It's you know what, let's balance what's flexibility, what is the personal interaction. So what does this mean at the end of the day while well, collaboration goes beyond what you see in a meeting? Right, you've got to think outside of meetings and start to better understand the people in the meeting. The reason for that is because we all work differently. If we talk about flexibility is how to uh, yeah, is yet to stay, you need to be able to choose how you work. And people around you need to be able to be comfortable with that. Right? So unwanted background noise can be uh, can be reduced through switching off uh, or, or having the right uh, tool sets with you. I mean, this is a very simple device. Noise cancelling doesn't cost an arm and a leg, but it really, really is, is good. But your idea here is to be able to work through out the day, depending on what you're doing. You've got your 8 a.m. start if you want to have an 8 a.m. start. You can work, you can start up at home. Uh, you can move to the office by 10 a.m. You can talk while you drive. At 1 p.m. you can go and sit down, have a, a, a lunch and still be online and still um, respond to, to whatever you need to in the meeting in space. At 3 p.m. you can do meetings from anywhere. At 5 p.m. hopefully wrap up and get on with it. Point B, behind this is the fact that it doesn't matter where we are anymore. As long as we have the tool sets and we're connected to the internet, we have a tool set through Teams to stay flexible, to stay engaged, to still do our work and to still collaborate with people across our uh, environment, but do it in confidence. This application runs, does not break regularly unless there's an update at seven o'clock in the morning but it's a great, great tool set to, to work on. And it really allows us to be flexible. This is stuff we know already. What is changing though, is that what is nice is people are starting to really use their time more effectively. So they're taking the time now to generate agendas for their meetings. They're keeping the meetings shorter than a half an hour. Some meetings now are 15 minutes, but what they do is do a lot of the pre-work upfront utilizing some of the other applications that are available. Obviously it's whiteboarding, obviously it's things like making sure that you've got one note in place so that you can get agendas out, that you can take notes, that you collaborate before the time so that you're only there to make the decisions and make it worthwhile uh, for you to engage very, very quickly. Other nice thing about this obviously is that you have got the ability to click on anybody's card over here um, a profile card and figure out who they are, who they report to. So really good around understanding who you are in a particular meeting. So a couple of features, right? So you've got meeting, uh, mo uh, a marketing sync meeting. You've got the notes. You've got the, you've got the ability to simultaneously write something. You've got the ability to click on the profile card and see who you're dealing with. Um, should it be an unknown en entity in the uh, environment? But the idea is to be as fluid as you possibly can. Come prepared, make the meeting quick, and get on with it uh, through that process. Um, for us, what's starting to really, really come into play is some really, really good stuff in so far as more as Microsoft's whiteboarding. Um, the whiteboard has been available now for approximately a year and a bit, so you can still be on a meeting, you can interact with each other, there's emojis, there's ways to pull in graphs, there's the way of free pen writing, which is really cool, it's like you're at the office, and just think about this, I'm using my office environment in order to facilitate, grow and make things happen uh, in, a, in a much more succinct way. 
Uh, meetings obviously uh, has uh, has uh, changed quite uh, considerably. Uh, you have the ability to optimize your content. Um, you have the ability to present better and you have the ability to in together mode, get everybody on the same page, pictorial format, see who you're talking to, why you're talking to them and have them uh, basically as they talk, come up, present, move in the back. So it's becoming extremely dynamic in terms of the way in which things are, are operating. There are still four ways in which you meet. You meet now, which is put a meeting in, in somebody's calendar straight away and get them to meet. You've got the set a meeting formally through your, ex, uh, through your exchange, through your calendaring or through Teams uh, for a future date. You've got webinars, which is a really, really nice interactive way you can meet up to a thousand people in that environment, but should you go beyond five, uh, a thousand people, it will automatically put you into a live scenario, which then allows you to get ten thousand people or, or or people into a, into or participants into a meeting. So these automatic, dynamic ways in which the the environment works um, really caters for and allows us to be able to scale quite quickly without us having to go and redo a meeting or anything in that line. OK, this talks a little bit around some of the follow up stuff. So what's quite nice is every meeting is recorded. Um, if you put on the recording, you can quickly download that. You can transcribe. Transcription is literally taking uh, the meeting, putting it into English and then guys, something really nice that's happened in the past four days um, is that uh, Microsoft's also allowed um, also has Zulu as a transcription language. It is such a cool, inclusive uh, maneuver that has happened for us. So really, really happy with that. Point at the end of the day is be aware of the fact that you can record these meetings. Doesn't matter what the contents is and you can share it with uh, with the people after um, if they were unable to make it, even when they were there. OK, thank you, Valerie. Um, see that. Let me just move on to the next slide quickly. Um, so for us, <clears throat> this virtual, the building virtual events uh, is extremely, extremely important. The ability to to leverage something like webinars and in webinars, something nice is going to happen. They're going to build breakout rooms so people like ourselves uh, can enter the webinar. We can go and do our preparation in that breakout room and then we can be released into the presentation as and when uh, we are required to do so. So you can schedule eight, nine, ten presenters uh, in a in in an engagement to present one after the other. Hopefully no, they don't all talk as much as what I do, but the point at the end of the day is that it's going to it's becoming more and more inclusive, uh, more and more uh, flexible, but also allows you that ability to get on with the roles and the jobs that you need to execute on, like training over a vast area, like training over a number of different geographies um, and so forth. So just think of the applications of how you get better at making these virtual events work for you. Um, this is just an extension to this. Uh, and you can do up to 10,000 uh, employees. Um, you know, there's uh, there's uh, some really decent advanced uh, production capabilities that are now also being built into uh, the uh, the experience, particularly for presenters. Uh, the tool sets like uh, PowerPoint Live is becoming really, really intuitive. It's AI orientated. It is really, really nice to sit down and, and chat and uh, and work in the uh, in this environment. Um, what we do do regularly now, though, and we haven't done one for, for this environment, but is to actually pop out uh, and keep the people interactive. I don't know whether you can see the emojis jumping up and down on the screen. The people are clapping hands. There's people that love it. There's people that are putting out smiles. Um, that's one way of interacting, but another way of interacting, obviously, is the ability to create polls and surveys. Very simple. You go to the ellipsis, you download the polls tool, you design your questions. It can be true, false, can be right a sentence, can be anything, but it really keeps people interacting in, in, in the environment. Um, I suppose really at the end of the day, it's really nice though for us lately, the extension to this is to be able to really get an attendance register, to then be able to 
get people to customize these or get ourselves to customize these uh, these registrations um, and then literally to automate it into a marketing event. So I'd love to see all the participants that are here uh, today, all 31 of you, uh, to come around again in a short while um, in the next session where we might talk about some other uh, some other decent features. Um, I suppose really at the end of the day, it's really, really important to be able to bridge the gap between remote and on-site collaboration. How do you do that? Well, you get more intuitive with setting up people that are at the office, people that are at home, and having nice environments like this office environment yeah, that has a device on the table that is smart, it's artificially intelligent, it picks up who's talking, it will show their picture, it might be one picture, it might be 10 pictures, depending on who's talking, but really it's around making sure that people are having a great experience and you do that through Teams rooms, right? One of the ways in which to evolve and enable your people to feel it's worth it to get back to the office. And there's lots of little devices that do this. Please reach out to us for more information. Idea here yeah, is just to talk a little bit around the connections. We showed you the emojis a little bit earlier on, so I agree. Big smiley face, although he doesn't look very interested, that dude. Uh, nice little, uh, little heart here around the fact that what you're saying is cool. But as you can see, it's around this enablement, around bringing the people and fostering the, the engagement for us as social people through our engagements in the environment. And we can move things around, which is cool. So I don't know whether you saw, but I'm reflecting as a little block in the bottom left hand corner or sorry, right hand corner of the presentation right now. That is a feature that Microsoft brought out. Uh, to allow you to still see me because there's nothing worse than just listening to a screen talk to you. At least you can see me move around. Sorry, I do talk with my hands quite considerably at the point at the end of the day is that it really brings a little bit of more interactiveness into the environment. Alrighty, um, I think something else that's important with meetings is then this ability to take advantage of the third party applications and or extensions like Viva that Microsoft has. Viva is an employee experience platform uh, that Microsoft has developed. If you stick that as a sticky note within your, uh, or as, a, as an application within your team's um, left hand pane, it will start collating, picking up information off of what you're doing through this little block called insights uh, on the top right hand corner. And the great thing behind that insights is that it will start picking up your, your rhythm. It will correlate that to the team's rhythm, more than three people, and the manager can start working out what best suits the team to, to do what they need to do. Right, let's get on with the next bit. So nice piece of functionality that's out there. For us, obviously, this is really, really important as part of a, a telco. The ability to make a phone call to anywhere else outside of your network, your mobile PBX. You're making a call using a, the appropriate licenses within the Microsoft span, clicking on a number or on a contact that's not part of your organization and dialing them, whether it's a GSM number or whether it's any other, uh, other number that you need to fix, line number, doesn't matter. But the point is you're breaking outside of your network and you're making a telephone call. It is PBX on steroids at the moment. There are so many features and functions coming out. It's just not funny. And Microsoft's enabling us to do this better. And how they're doing that is through something called Operator Connect. So you will be able to see in your Microsoft Teams admin center, the Operator Connect partners that are available in South Africa currently. Some of them are international and their head offices have driven down that uh, that people can buy uh, Operator Connect or their telephony service from, uh, from them here in South Africa. Others like ourselves, Vox is a pure South African company doing it for the South African people. Please go and research, go and have a look at this and get back to us if you need any assistance in that place. Last but not least, it's around making sure that everybody is on one environment. So you can see uh, there's a little tablet very small tablet actually, with everything that we need in one place. 
and researchers are starting to have a look at what does it mean for you to bounce between applications. So I'm in Teams, now I need to make a phone call, I need to go to my PBX to do that, why not do it out of Teams? It can save you 15 minutes a day not to have to click through applications to get to where you want to. So render your applications in the right place. Together with this, obviously, we cannot have a discussion if we're not about oh, if we're not talking about um, uh, Azure and the ability to utilize uh, Azure communication services as a customizable tool to bring in any application that you want. So you can have a line of business applications that you wanted rendered through Teams. You utilize the Azure environment uh, uh, to do that. And then last but not least, obviously from our perspective, you cannot go anywhere without the underlying security measures that Microsoft had put in place, two-factor authentication, et cetera, et cetera, to deliver what you need to deliver in this space. Chris, I may have eaten into your space. I'd like to now introduce you a little bit to Chris uh, Bodnost, uh, a colleague of mine, uh, works with me effectively uh, around making sure that we can get security and the security message out to customers utilizing different tool sets from Microsoft. So I shall unshare, I shall hand over to Chris and hopefully uh, he'll uh, share and be live in a second or two. Great stuff. Thank you, Chris. Thank you, team. Thank you, Doug. Let's can go. you guys hear me? Yes, we can. Visible. Can you see me? Can you we see can. my presentation? We can see your preso. We so we can pull the trigger. Right. Pull the trigger. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, thank you for lending me your ears and your time today. Um, I, my name is Chris Bardnost. I work for Braintree um, by Vox Telecom. I um, specifically look after the Azure environment, um, Azure environments for our customers, um, and head up the division for, for the Microsoft Cloud services as, as a whole. Um, I thought today I would um, change the topic from the original topic just to um, a topic that's going to affect um, a lot of um, the customers and potential customers that are in the meeting um, this afternoon. And um, a, a topic also where I'm seeing a lot of interest and a lot of um, um, attention captured by Microsoft itself. And um, the, 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 the general topic of that is um, hybrid multi-cloud solutions and, and how to solve problems with, um, with hybrid de deployments um, over, over various clouds. So um, I'm going to jump right into it, and uh, if there are questions afterwards, please, 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 um, just uh, put them in the Q&A, and I'll gladly, gladly attend to those questions. So these days, um, you know, after COVID, and specifically in COVID, um, in the past two years, so this is 740, 50 days now, um, a lot has changed. And some of what has changed is the application landscape and the IT services la landscape of, of a lot of our customers. What we are seeing uh, from the brain pers perspective in our customer base at the moment is a lot of diversif diversification of IT services. So some customers, um, and, and, and uh, as you'll see on the, on the slide here, have chosen to take some services onto an AWS environment. Now, AWS, for, the, for those who don't know, um, it's Amazon Web Services um, Data Center. You know, um, A lot of our customers will be seeing a still got a lot of the IT services, and let me just elaborate a bit on IT services. A lot of business applications like your Sage, your Pastel, your, um, you know, whatever line of business, CRM, ERP um, um, services that you're running, have now in the COVID moved those, moved those services maybe to a Google environment, even an Azure environment, or they've gone to Hyper-V or VMware. But the crux of the matter is that suddenly you're sitting in the situation, and I'm seeing this with the customers, is that now suddenly um, you've got um, services and applications installed on um, a, a server there at your uh, um, at your head office, you've got some in the cloud, 
and you've got some there, and you've got some SARS offerings, you've got three, six, five there, and we've ended up in a situation where it's diversified, and we've got we've got we've actually lost control of things, basic things in our IT services, such as update management and, and basic um, services like that. So in the hybrid space and, and, and the solution to this, and what I want to propose to you and just demonstrate to you in the rest of the session, is a tool that's available in the Azure set of services called Azure Arc. And the primary, the primary objective and service functionality of Azure, Azure Arc is to do exactly what I've just mentioned, Ma, that, that chaos, that mess. Um, I've got servers here, I've got servers there. You know, even um, with customers with multiple branches, you've got various servers running at various branches um, on various platforms like Windows and Linux and what, what have you. Azure Arc provides the functionality to yourself and your organization to take the proverbial LAN cable Go plug in that virtual LAN cable into all of those services and have a single pane of glass to view all of those services and manage them from one central point. So, and effectively, um, you know, just as a review, those services could be anywhere. They could be in Hyper-V, VMware, AWS, Google, Oracle. Azure Arc combines that all by that virtual LAN cable and plugs it into um, Azure. And you, as the IT manager or the CIO, have got one plane of pane of glass that you can use to see that. Okay. Now, with a lot of our customers, and we've, um, and a few of our customers that we have done this with, there's a few things that happen immediately when we've activated this virtual LAN cable. You know, um, we've plugged it in, and there's immediate results that are that, that start coming out from uh, from uh, the Azure Arc plugin. The first one that um, you, you'll, you'll notice um, is you'll see that um, if you've combined your Azure Arc with a, uh, with a Defender for Cloud, um, you'll go into your Azure portal and you'll be confronted by um, a thing called your security posture or your security score. And the second thing you'll see is um, regulatory compliance. Okay, great. So what, is this, what does this mean? Yeah, so, okay, so I've went and I'm going to, I went into all these diverse platforms, plugged it in, and it's telling me that I've got a security score of 44%. Okay, basically, what Azure Arc and Defender for Cloud is, have done is they've, um, in a 24-hour period, scanned every single device that you've connected into the platform, and um, it's analyzed it from a security perspective. It's done an assessment on that on that server, um, which is, by the way, nothing that you have to install on the server itself. It's agentless. No, actually, I like it. Uh, it's not uh, as intrusive. Um, and it's gone and collected all that information and given you, um, in this particular environment that we've done for, 44%. So um, it, the nice thing about this um, the security score for your CFOs and your CEOs, um, and for those CEOs and CPOs and listening, it's a nice single digit metric KPI that gives me a one point indication of how secure my environment is. Right, that's number one. Number two, what am I seeing here? So the second thing I'm seeing here is a regulatory compliance score. Now, um, in this particular scenario, 28 of 43 pass controls. Great, what does that mean? Right, so a lot of us, we have got ISO 27001 that we're busy um, running out. We've got CIS controls or PCI uh, regulatory com compliance. What Azure Arc and Defender for Cloud have done in the background, they've gone and scanned your environment and, and, and assessed your environment based on the regulatory compliance that you've selected to implement in the environment. I just want to, um, as a side note, say you can select ISO, PCI when you implement these tools, and it will bring back, it will bring back that, um, that information and give you a score. Great. So let's just go back one. It's one thing having a score. Uh, which is great. So, and it's one thing having a regulated compliance, but what do I do with it? And the next set of functionality, um, which Azure Arc can enable you um, as the IT manager or the CIO is, and most likely what your CFO and your, your boss is going to ask you is, how do you improve the score? So with Defender for Cloud and, and with Azure Arc, 
Um, it provides you the ability of where I had those nice big um, red circles. You click on that and it will immediately give you uh, a, rec a list of recommendations that need to be um, implemented. Right. So let's take an example. Number one, so we still have 43% here with, um, with um, ABC um, removers. And you'll notice that on the screen here, it's it advising um, um, ABC Zero to enable MFA. And I'm just going to pause there. Um, everyone in the, in the session, if you have not enabled MFA, I implore you um, to uh, activate multi-factor authentication on your um, 365 environment. It is your first line of defense against brute force attacks and, get, uh, and, and hackers getting into your environment. So I'll get off my soapbox there. So back into the, back into the recommendations here. You'll see that if this particular um, environment and this um, session, uh, session, this tenant, had to implement the enable MFA, um, there's a potential score increase of 18%. So just by simply in increasing that um, that MFA, we're implementing the MFA, and there's a few recommendations behind that. Or out of the out of the bat, the security score is going to lift to 61%. Now suddenly we're looking better, right? So we started on 43, and by the way, this particular example started on 21% about three weeks back. It's now gone up to 43. And the next steps will be to enable MFA. You'll also notice that down here, um, you know, once we've activated these tools, there's a few uh, vulnerabilities that we need to um, re remediate. Great. So let's go remediate them. Let's go add another 11%. Let's go from 61% to 72%. Right. We started on 21%, we now on 72%, and it took about three or four weeks to get this running. Not just that, my environments, my servers are much safer and have better security posture than they were when I first implemented Azure Arc and Defender for Cloud. But then how did I go about fixing it? So you do not have to be necessarily be a security expert um, to implement these controls. Um, Azure Arc and a Defender for Cloud give you a step-by-step -step instruction um, on how you as the IT manager, even CIO, or maybe um, one of the, um, the desktop technician um, can go. So simply by, okay, great. I need to go remediate vulnerabilities, okay? Um, it's on one of my SQL, uh, SQL server machines. And um, it's the vulnerability assessment findings in the SQL. And you'll see that there's two ways to fix these remediations. First one is you, um, you can simply go uh, click quick fix if it's available to you, um, or if it, if it has to be done a manual, uh, a manual way, um, um, a Defender for Cloud will advise you on the step-by-step -step process that you need to do to maybe encrypt your disks or do something that needs to be done. Right. Now, um, I was a, a, a CIO and an IT manager and a head of IT for various organizations before I joined uh, Braintree by Box Telecom seven years ago. And the 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 moment I used to regret, um, or the, the, the phase of the year I used to regret was when I was asked to do um, a, a compliance report. Um, and um, it, it used to um, be constitute or um, be an exercise of going collecting massive amounts of information and going and, and, and um, speaking to your operations managers and your service managers and whoever they may be, and compiling this big report and giving it to KPMG, PwC, wherever you're is doing your IT risk audit. Um, I'm glad to show, show whoever uh, can make the most benefit out of this is that um, Azure Arc and Defender for Cloud now um, have automatic compliance reports that you can generate out of your um, um, all the hard work that you've done in the previous three or four weeks. So you simply do that by going into the security portal and you select your reporting standard, which is your regulatory compliance, choose your format, download, and it will give your auditors, your IT risk auditors, uh, hang on. So it will give, it will give um, your IT, um, IT risk auditors um, a full coverage report of everything that you've implemented in, inside your organization. In this particular case, identity and access management, security sensor centers, networking and the likes, all um, under control. In order to contact us as evidence that you have done a, ho a, a whole lot of hard work in the past six months or whenever you started implementing this. Right, 
some other features that Azure Arc can bring to you can provide you in inventory. It can provide you update management. I, I neglected to say that in the beginning of the session. Um, you can have one update policy for all your environments. And, and I'm saying this once again, no matter where it is, if it's in AWS, Hyper-V, Azure, um, wherever it is, you can have one update policy for your entire infrastructure to roll out. Then uh, change tracking, what, who's done what changes on what servers. Um, do I need to roll back to a previous state, state configuration? That's all available, especially um, useful in de development environments and production environments. And insights. And then lastly, I just want to touch base on, on a, a, an additional tool that can be plugged into the Azure Arc and Defender for Cloud, um, Azure Sentinel. And now we've, as I've said, we've, you know, I keep on saying that we've generated the reports for our auditors and we've, um, we've done all our hard work um, on our infrastructures to make sure that all our um, vulnerabilities and, uh, are remediated. And uh, we've got our score now on 86% uh, to 90%. And now somebody needs to keep watch over that entire environment. So that entire environment being now at the 86 and all the regulatory compliant, uh, compliance have been indicated, in comes Sentinel. So Sentinel effectively is your SIEM system, your security incident and event management system. It will monitor your environment, much like the security guard is doing right here, 24-7-365. It uses this by plugging into a lot of very, very clever machine learning tools that Microsoft have developed and, um, and patterns that they know how to recognize. Once a pattern is recognized, it will detect that um, detect a pattern and it can actually phone you awake one o'clock in the morning. You can see that. So it can actually uh, call you. And why would, why, why would it want to call you? Well, ransomware attacks don't happen at one o'clock in an afternoon. Um, it happens in one o'clock in the morning in the morning when you're fast asleep and uh, you're not going to be reading your emails or your SMSs or your WhatsApps at that time and waking up seven o'clock and your entire environment's encrypted. So it's got the ability to wake you up and say this something is not lucky here. And they've gotten through, uh, whatever it may be. Right. Um, and then guys, that's um, that's my part of the session. I think I've made it well within time. Uh, thank you for your time and thank you for listening to me. If there's any more questions, you can you can put it out into the um, on the Q and A now. Thanks, Annette. Thanks, Doug. Thank you very much, Chris. Always appreciated, um, guys. Just uh, I, I know we always skip over. I mean, we skimmed at the the at a very high level uh, the touch points uh, that we're trying to portray and get through to you um, as uh, as uh, customers as attendees. Uh, as potential customers. So, um, you know, we, we try a kind of six week rhythm with regard to uh, Let's Connect. Um, so what we're going to try and do now is start breaking out uh, into some what we call customer experience workshops, a little bit more deep dives uh, into the product sets. We'll take a topic and we'll really drive down into how does it work? Why does it work that way? Why do you need to do uh, why do you need to set it up this way? How are the settings going to work for you? How to set and then do a little bit more of a functional kind of engagement around uh, some of the topics that we've had to date. Um, many people won't know where to even switch on multi-factor authentication. So let's take you through that process and show you how to do it. Um, these are the kind of things that we want to add value back into, uh, into for. So um, so these workshops, uh, Valwell Drive will send out a couple of invites of the people that have attended these uh, these sessions. Uh, please join us, um, those that are relevant, um, and uh, bring a friend. Uh, thank you very, very much for your time. We're going to give you six minutes back. I don't see many uh, questions published. Um, if you have anything, reach out to us. Um, I think in so closing out, uh, Annette and M will, will probably distribute the uh, the uh, the recording of the session. Uh, I'd like to personally thank you for the hour that you spent with us. Um, really appreciate it, and uh, have a have a great afternoon. Thank you very much, team. Uh, enjoy it. Thank you, Annette, for putting this together, and Valerie for driving the content for us. Uh, really appreciate your efforts in this space. Uh, thank you, everybody. Bye bye. Thank you, everybody. Bye-bye.